Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. In more than 28 years of corrections, I have used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of the Pepperball system. From cell extractions to disturbances on the rec yard, Pepperball is the first option in my correctional toolbox. With the ability to transition quickly from area saturation to direct impact with the non-lethal PAVA projectiles, Pepperball provides me with a range of non-lethal options for cell extractions involving non-compliant inmates, and when the use of force is over, decontamination is easy, with no oily residue on the walls or floors. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the show notes below. Pepperball is the safer option first. Okay, well, welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. My name is Mike Cantrell. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about tactical teams uh, and tactical teams specifically inside of corrections. Now, I've been a, I've been on a team since the beginning of my career. Probably nine, ten months into my career was when I first got on a team, and I was on a team from that point on of some sort. Um, I care a lot about the teams I've been on. Uh, I care a lot about uh, the job that we did, how important it was to the institution, um, and I have some thoughts. <laughs> uh, imagine that. But uh, no, I'm going to talk to you today about, I'm not going to go so much into uh, the tactics of a team right now. We may do something with that later on. Uh, today, I want to start off with the basics, and, and, and that's the leadership of the team, how you lead a team, how you bring people on that team how you keep those people motivated, how you keep them trained, um, how you set the standard for them. So, you know, that that's what I think I'm going to go in today, and, and we'll see where it takes us, you know. Now, I know every place has different teams. There, there's, there's all kinds of teams and corrections, and I'm not going to single one out as being the best or the worst or, or anything like that, you know, whether it's a – you know, and you're in a jail or correctional center and you've got a CERT team, a, either a SERT or a CERT, Correctional Emergency Response Team. Uh, some of you may have, you know, uh, teams at a higher level, a higher level of training that may be a hostage rescue team or a, a special operations response team, uh, SWAT team even. Uh, and you may call it different things where you're at, but it's all, it's kind of the same thing, you know. Um but there's also canine units, you know, canine teams. Uh, that was one of the early teams I was on, and I learned a lot while I was on there. Um, disturbance control teams or riot control teams or uh, cell extraction teams. I don't know, you know, they get called all different kinds of acronyms across the country, whether it's jail or whether it's prison. And um, But in the end, the leadership of that team is the same, okay? And how you run that team, how you present yourself on that team is what truly matters. So I think the first thing that I want to say is to the team leaders, the team leaders and the assistant leaders, and even some of those leaders that may not have that title, but everybody on the team looks to them. I guess my number one thought on having a good team is that a good team is a reflection of its leader. I've never seen a good team that had a bad leader or that was being led poorly because too many things break down. So that's where it starts. And whether you're the administrator, the warden, um, whether you're a captain and you're picking out that person to run that team, you need to look at, at all aspects of their leadership. And if they don't have leadership, they shouldn't be in charge of a team. Doesn't mean they can't be a member of the team and doesn't mean they can't be a, a very important member of the team. I know lots of people who have knowledge and skills that don't have leadership. Uh, running a team and making sure that it remains a well-run, well-trained, ready-to-go-at-any-moment team 
takes more than just um, skills and tactics. It takes leadership. So um, that's something I want to uh, stress, I guess, right off the things, right, right off the, right off the quick there. So I always go back to a, there's a quote by Ronald Reagan, and I always go back to that. And um, Ronald Reagan said, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He's the one that gets people to do the greatest things. So also, when you take a look at that leader, the leader doesn't necessarily have to have the best tactical skills. They should absolutely have good skills. They may not have to have the most knowledge. Um, Take a look at corporations throughout the country, big companies, you know, uh, and you've probably heard this said before. I think it was Elon Musk, but uh, said, I may not know everything, but I surround myself with people who do. So when you're looking to put that team together, you're looking for a leader who can get other people on board and get them to work together. Um, our goal is is never known or immediate, you know, until it happens, but it has preparedness is probably the goal prepared for whatever eventuality comes down the pike. Um, so. I guess that's the first thing I want to say is is make sure that you've got the right person leading that team before you start worrying about the skills or the tactics. So what what are you looking for in this person? I think it's the same old stuff, you know, nothing new here. There's nothing invented here. You're looking for a leader that's got integrity, honesty, responsibility, um, justice has a sense of justice about them especially in the job that we have and people don't always like this but in order to be on those teams you have to find somebody with a little bit of ego now i'm not talking about the person whose ego overwhelms and is a detriment but you have to have a little bit of self-worth and self-drive and self-discipline a little bit of ego in order to get up in front of a group of men, women, whoever's on the team, and lead them, especially at that level. So those are some of the traits that I look for when I'm looking for a leader um, of a tactical team or a special team in corrections. Let's talk about vision and goals. Um, there's a lot of leaders out there who who are good at setting goals. You know, hey, we're going we're gonna to reach this. I want all the team members able to do this, but a good team leader has a vision and that vision doesn't have specifics necessarily. That vision is the way that that team is seen as a whole, that the way that that team is seen by the institution. Now, absolutely, we can have goals. You know, I want all my, my team to be able to uh, run a half mile in, in this amount of time. I want all my team to be able to shoot at this level. And those are great goals, but the vision has to be that I want a team when other people look at it, people want to be part of that team. And I'll talk more about that later, but, um, you know, that's a vision. It's a clear image of how you see the future. And visions grow and expand. As that team grows, as it gets bigger, that vision's going to grow. Goals are achievable. Goals are measured. So when you get that leader and you're sitting down with them and you're getting them started on that team, these are some of the things to talk to them about. They have to step out of that tactical leadership role, which most of us on teams are very good at. We've been, we've been, you know, leading from the front for a long time. But when you take over the leadership of a team, you have to become a strategic leader. And a strategic leader takes a higher point of view over the leadership. A strategic leader sees everything, every part of the team, not just one thing. I guess the next thing that I go into and the next thing I want to talk about is professionalism. So many teams, and I'm not talking about, you know, banter in the locker room. I'm not talking about towel slap and a lot of this stuff we can't do anymore. When I came up, I mean, uh, there was hazing. There was, uh, you know, you, you might get uh, shot with a couple of beanbag rounds. Uh, you might get shot with pepper ball, you know, 
uh, that was things that we did to each other to uh, bring them onto the team. You might have to run circles around the team while they're running cadence, you know. Um, those were the type of things that we did back then. That doesn't happen as much now, and nor should it. I, I think the world's come to a different place with that. Um, but when you look at those guys and gals, when I say guys, I mean everybody. When you look at those guys and gals, you're looking for someone who could show professionalism. Someone who is looked up to at work. You can't be a you can't be a slob at work and a great team leader or a slob at work and a great team member because the way you're viewed at work is the way your peers view you on that team. And that will bring down, you know, the way the teams look at. It. So, um, you need people who are professionals, who understand that they're not just, um, you know, a correctional officer. They're members of the criminal justice system. They play a part in the whole system, and they carry themselves that way. Um, you need people who are there for more than just a paycheck. Now, paychecks are great, and I'm not going to do the job without one either. But if paycheck is the only reason you're there, you won't have the motivation to do what needs to be done in a situation. Paycheck isn't enough. Okay. So I'm looking for people who have motivation, who want to be the best, people who want to be seen as the best, people who want to help others. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a public servant. Okay. I'm looking for a pub, a person with a public servant attitude. And that's tough sometimes in corrections. I know that. Um, but I want someone who stands up and, you know, when they stand up and people see them, that it changes, you know, the old tired narratives about prison guards, turnkeys, you know. I want someone on my team that they look to and they go, wow, that that person has got it going. That person is a professional. That person is representing their profession well okay so that that's what we're looking for we're looking for a professional when we start looking at team members and there's more than one reason why we do that and that's because professionalism carries over okay if you find that professional officer who carries themselves well in the seg unit or in a housing unit at work that's going to carry over to how they handle themselves during crisis Okay, we don't need um, that old, hey, we're going to go in there and crush them. That's nothing but liability and injury these days. Okay, we don't go in and crush people. Yeah, we're going to take it back. It's our house, but we're going to do it the right way. We're going to use the tools that we've been given, less lethal, non-lethal, lethal, whatever it takes. But the old idea of going in there and crushing an inmate, you know, um, you can't afford to have a team member who has a punishment mentality. The The mentality they have to go in there with is the justice mentality, the mentality that they're there, there to do a job as part of the criminal justice system. Okay. They're not there for retribution or revenge or to make someone pay for what they did. That's not what we do. And it's dangerous to have people on the team who think like that. So um, make sure that you've got the people in there who are professional at work and that you require that professionalism on the team also. Team members. Now let's talk, we've talked about what a leader should be and what a leader should look for. But let's, let's ask the question, what do team members want from leaders, right? Well, team members want and expect good leadership. That's what they're looking for. They are willing to put in the time and the effort needed to be the best, right? And with that, they want team leaders who expect the best from themselves and everyone else. If I'm going to spend my extra time, and I did over the years, yes, I know sometimes you got comp time, sometimes you got overtime, um, but nowhere did I get compensated for all the time. I put into studying, preparing, working out, being ready, uh, and being part of a team. 
the money that I kicked in as being part of a team, the the equipment that I bought on my own, right? Um, so I wasn't there just for a paycheck. I was there because I wanted to be part of something bigger. And with that, I expected leadership who expected the best out of me, expected the best out of themselves, and expected the best out of the rest of that team. That's what motivates the people who stand up and say, you know, I'll be there when the emergency happens. They're not motivated by the money. They're not motivated by any of that. They're motivated by the fact that they have a feeling of justice. They have a feeling of public service, that they care about the person they walk next to in that prison. That's why they raise their hand. That's why they show up on a team. So uh, absolutely make sure that you've got a leader in there who's doing that for that team, for the team members that expects the best out of not only themselves, but everyone else on that team. It's so important. You know, there's a, uh, there's another quote that I absolutely love and, um, it's an old one, very old. It is from 500 BC. Uh, his name was Heraclitus. Okay. And he said, and you may have heard this before. I think it was part of, uh, one of the 300 movies or something. No, he said, out of every 100 men, 10 shouldn't be there. 80 are just targets. Nine are the real fighters, and we're lucky to have them, for they make the battle. But one, ah, one is the warrior, and he will bring the others back. And I love that quote, because when you look at teams, um, you will see that. When you, when you look at a correctional center, and there's 100 people there, you're going to see 10 who are the real team members, who are the professionals, who are the real fighters. And then you look to that one who's going to be a leader. And, and that's why that, that quote has always struck me. But I just wanted to share that with you for a minute. So as a leader, what's some of the things that you want to do for your team? And I mean, I'm not talking tactics, I'm not talking skills, but in order to make a cohesive team, to build a team, to, to build resilience in a team, what do you want to do? You know, high performing teams, number one, experience a full range of emotions together. And I didn't know that for, for many, many years. You know, we, we did the danger, we did the fun, you know, we did the, uh, you know, we, we put them through the drills, tough times, um, you know, to bring that cohesion together, but high performing teams experience a full range. So if you're going to put them through tough times, you got to give them some downtime too, to reconnect, to remesh with each other, right? If you're going to put them in danger, you got to find a time for them to have some fun. And here's the one I never knew or thought about. But in order for a team to really be cohesive, they need to experience happiness and sadness. And when you think about it, the teams that experience all that stuff together are the ones who are the most cohesive, who are the tightest who work the best together. And that's because you've developed, much like a family, you've developed, you know, this interpersonal relationship with each of those team members. You know something about them. You know what they're like when they're happy. You know what they're like when they're sad. You've been through tough times. You've been through easy times. You've had fun. You've been in a dangerous spot with them. And once you experience all that, once a team that's been together for a while experiences all that, and if you'll think back, you'll recognize those teams that you've seen that way. Those are the teams that have the cohesion, that care about each other, and that work the best together. That That's what I would say to a team leader, is build that resilience, build that cohesion with that team. And that's how you do it. Absolutely get them out there and drill them and, and, and you know, make them sweat. Put them out there on that cold day on the range. But come back inside and 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 have a few minutes to sit down and warm up and and you know bring out a warm drink or something allow them to 
develop the interpersonal part of it. If you've had these times of danger, sometimes you got to, you know, have that break. Burnout's a big thing right now because inside our prisons, people are going through tough times over and over and over again, and they're not getting that time off to have a little bit of fun. And that's how our body releases the stress of those situations. So make sure that you're doing that as a team leader also. And I told you I'd come back to this, but when we talk about recruitment, and I I hear a lot about recruitment as far as correctional officers, but we're talking about team recruitment here. And what I've seen in the recent years, recruitment's got tougher. The choices of the number of officers has got less. And we're letting anybody that raises a hand or puts in a memo get on a team. And I don't believe in that. I know you need the numbers. If the person you're selecting isn't good enough when you have a full complement, then they're not good enough when you need to build membership. Okay? Don't just fill a slot. Don't just put, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Sam Samworth said when he was on the, put uh, bums in seats. Don't just fill seats with whoever, you know, it matters who's on the team. Because if you bring on the wrong person, you can bring the team down. Bringing a person on your team that has a negative attitude or or bad behavior or bad self-control can put a whole team at risk. So don't settle. I know that's tough. I know you need the numbers, but don't settle. Um, you know, one of the ways that uh, I kept my team members from you know, I'm I'm not going to say becoming lazy, but becoming bored with what they do is to make them feel part of the team as a whole, but give them areas where they have individual ownership of certain parts of the team, right? Um, and, and a lot of that happens just by breaking the team into different areas and allowing them to have different uh, areas that they train on. And you may already do this, but noticing it as a leader and how you're going to spread that out matters, okay? And and maybe everybody needs the opportunity to excel. So figure out some ways, you know, um, break your team into squads and have squad leaders and assistant squad leaders. Um, Have team members who are good at something be a trainer. Break your team into different subsets. Maybe you have a breaching team. Uh, Some of the higher level teams might have snipers, have a sniper team, right? Um, Defensive tactics instructors, have people on your team who, who instruct defensive tactics and give them ownership of making sure that the team's ready at all times. Um, And that can be any type of trainer, uh, non, non non-lethal, less lethal, uh, whatever you have and whatever you're using on your team, but let them have the ownership of that. and. Having those individual areas of ownership inside a team, that's one of the things that you can do. Your team members should always feel part of the team as a whole, but breaking the team into squads or sections, that can let individual members feel like they have a certain level of ownership. And that's important. That's important. Very important. Another thing I'm going to talk about is just, you know, invest in training. The worst thing that can happen to a team is poor training. I truly believe that. You have to go out and find a great trainer. There, somebody on your team. If you don't have somebody on your team, then then you need to bring somebody from the outside to train your team. Because having a great trainer who will invest time and effort into developing training is one of the most important things that you can do for your team. You need a trainer that's engaging and informative and exciting and and makes them motivated. You know, there's nothing worse than, and we've all done it, you know, I I think all law enforcement's the same, but corrections, we have our annual training or we have this training, mandatory training that we have to take. And here you are sitting four hours while somebody reads a PowerPoint. It's the most it's the worst. Okay. In my opinion, it's the worst. 
uh, to have to sit there and just suffer through four hours of somebody reading a PowerPoint because they are not invested in that training. They don't care about whether or not you get it. They just want to put it down on a piece of paper so that you can have a certificate so it can be in your training file. You know, so to keep your team going, you've got to find good trainers. And if you if you have good trainers on the team, that's a plus. Give them the ability to go to training. You know, when that money does come down into the year or whatever, make sure that they're getting to go out there and get certified so that they can bring the new ideas back to your team. I may have talked about this on the website or on the uh, podcast before, but, uh, you know, I, I thank my wife because for many, many years, once a year, she would let me take some of our budget and go take a class. And I would go take a class that had nothing to do with the Bureau of Prisons, you know, whether it was public speaking or leadership or, you know, I, I took a breaching class. I took some, you know, uh, pistol classes at a, a couple of ranges. and invested in myself, invested in myself as a trainer. And I learned skills and knowledge from outside of the agency I worked for. And then I was able to bring that to the agency. And that made my training more exciting. It made it informative and it made people motivated to sit in my classes. And I think it's carried on to, uh, you know, I do a lot of training these days now that I'm retired. That's all I do. So um, I can't overemphasize the importance of investing in training. And don't get stuck in letting the same people in your agency teach the same problems the others. Does that make sense? I see so much where... Uh, and I saw it over the years where we would take someone who was a a mediocre supervisor, and then they'd bring them in to teach new supervisors. What do you think you're going to get out of that? You're going to get more mediocre supervisors. That makes no sense to me. If you look at the corporate world, if you look outside of some of the big agencies, they bring people in from the outside. They bring people in who change. Uh, the way people think inside their companies or inside their agencies. They don't allow the same ideas to be recycled over and over and over again until they're dead. So um, whatever you have to do, invest in training, find good trainers, make sure that your team members want to show up and uh, to be part of that. We we talked about this just a little bit, uh, but I think the final thing I kind of want to talk about is discipline, you know, on your team. You're going to have times when you have a bad apple, you know, when a person comes on that team um, and for whatever reason, uh, they don't want to be there. As a leader, that's a tough time. I've had to do it several times. Now, don't just, don't just cut that apple out of the basket right off. I do believe in giving everybody a chance. And sitting down with them, trying to understand what's going on, why they don't want to be at the same level of motivation as the rest of the team, why they're not trying their best to make the team succeed. You know, those are conversations that you have to have with them. But if you do find that bad apple and you find that person who's who's not a positive part of the team, then absolutely. Make the necessary uh, paperwork, make the necessary notifications, and remove them from the team because absolutely it can put the whole team at risk. And I've seen it. I've seen it where it happened Uh, on teams I was on, and I watched leadership who would not remove someone who was causing problems. Uh, So that's just, that's something I want you to think about. And then when we talk about demanding discipline from your team members. Now, I don't mean that you have to be that hard-ass, strict uh, drill sergeant all the time with your team, but a team that is disciplined, a team that is very disciplined will show discipline during a crisis, right? And in, in the profession we're in, in corrections, I can't afford to have loose cannons. I can't afford to have somebody throwing that haymaker 
you know, when they get in the cell because they got mad. I can't afford to have somebody firing, you know, 20 shots of pepper ball instead of the policy requirement of 12. I need people who do what they're told, how they're told, when they're told. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't think on their own, but I don't need rogue people bringing liability and injury to the rest of the team. So it's important that you have discipline. It's important that you have fun. So as a team leader, you've got to, you got to balance that. You got to, you know, have both of them, but just remember you can't afford a loose cannon during a critical incident and teamwork doesn't exist without discipline. If there's no discipline, you won't have any teamwork. They'll all be going in their separate directions. It's not the it's not the fun part of being a, a team leader. It's not the best part of being a team leader, but it's a very important part of being a team leader is to is to have that discipline and demand that discipline from your team. Because uh, uh and those of you that have listened, there's a podcast out there by Jocko Willing and uh I listen to it quite a bit. But he said it's it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate. And I absolutely believe that you can tell people not to, not to, not to, but if you're letting them do it, that's the same as saying yes. So whether that's their actions during training or whether that's, you know, uh, their actions in the real instances, whether it's a cell entry or whether you're having a, uh, you know, take back a housing unit or, or whatever you've got going, uh, if you tolerate it, they're going to do it no matter how many times you said not to. So just remember that it, it's not what you preach. It's what you tolerate as a team leader. So, well, I, I think that, uh, that covers the highlights of what I wanted to talk about with team leadership, um, and tactical teams. I will say that the best staff, I think, grow up on teams. They're the most well-rounded. They're the most uh, knowledgeable about their jobs. They're given the opportunity for additional training. So if you're a newer staff member out there, I would absolutely suggest that you do whatever it takes to find a team and get on it. Now, whether that's a cert team or, a, a, you know, a negotiations team, or those guys are absolutely important. A quarter of all uh, prison riots between 1900 and 1990 were solved through negotiation. So it's very important that we've got those people. Um, a canine team, canine unit, cert team, sort team, SRT team, whatever you call it at your agency, uh, get out there and be part of that and, uh, become, it'll help you become the best correctional officer, the best prison officer that you can, the best deputy that you can. So, well, I think that's it for today. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll see you next time on the Prison Officer Podcast. I would like to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors that make the Prison Officer Podcast possible. Omni RTLS is a company that I've been working with for the last year. I am proud to be part of this team of correctional professionals who have developed the best real-time locating system on the market today. With Omni's real-time location technology, you automatically know the accurate locations and interactions of all inmates, staff, and assets anywhere in your correctional facility, and you have this information in real time. Omni is cutting-edge software for today's jails and prisons. It is the only way to monitor every square inch of your facility while still being PREA compliant. Go to www.omnirtls for more information and to make your facility safer today. That's www.omnirtls.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Till next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls.